Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Mind After the Game. Today, I am joined by Lex Vandenberg um, from Seasons Africa, as well as All Stars. How are you today? I'm good, thanks. Yeah, a long time ago. That <laughs> I think well, yeah. Africa was over 20 years ago at this point, which is hard, hard to um, hard to imagine. Yeah, long time ago. Wow, that really, it seems like I got really into Survivor over COVID, like I think a lot of people did. I kind of had this re- viewing of survivor and it was awesome i guess that's one great thing about covid um <laughs> <laughs> no it's so, been interesting because um there's a ton of people that were probably not even born when i when i played the game and it aired that um that that have now gotten into all the old seasons because they just started streaming them you know on on paramount and netflix and whatnot and all of a sudden there's this huge new crop of of fans and viewers that um yeah. That, that have just popped out of nowhere it's it's pretty it's pretty trippy it's almost like the the clock got reset you know yeah it's kind of a cool era for survivor then so it'll be interesting to see what happens in the next like couple of years for it um yeah so yeah so in general thank you for coming and agreeing to work with me today no it's my pleasure and i think um you know i want to thank you for doing what i think is a is is just a is a great service to all of us and not only the the, the fans and the viewers but also all of us who played the game and just acknowledging that um you know it's uh it can be it, for some people it can be you know a life-changing experience you know for the negative right and yeah. but just acknowledging that you know back back in the in, in the old days you know in the in the old school when i when i was playing the game um most people didn't even want to acknowledge that um that the game would have any impact on our lives at all in fact, it was it was a bone of contention when when we had the Survivor All Stars finale. Um, Jerry Manthe and I, you know, when we were being kind of interviewed by Probst at Madison Square Garden in front of this huge uh, audience, this huge live audience, you know, Jerry Manthe and I wanted to kind of make a point that everybody always says it's just a game, but for us, it's not a game. It's like it's it's a it's a significant chunk of our real lives, and when we're out there. Um, you know, it's easy. It's it's you know. I think nowadays with the new school kind of mentality, people really the players have really kind of ex they've accepted the fact that it should just be seen as just a game. Mm -hmm. um, and and I think that uh, it's it's what makes it easier for players these days to you know casually um, dissolve alliances. You know, they make alliances, they break them, they backstab people. All of that now is really kind of accepted as part of part of the the strategy in the game. But back then it wasn't. And when you mm -hmm. made handshake deals with people, um, if you're like me, those were deals that you would take, you know, you would take those to the grave. And um, and I remember at that finale, that all-stars finale, Jerry Manthe and I were booed by, you know, thousands of people. And she actually, she left the stage. She she left, she, she didn't come back. She was like, well, I'm done because people just could not accept the fact that um, that for us, it's not just a game, that it is, it is actual, you know, it's our, it's our life. And, and we're not playing characters on TV. We're not actors playing characters. We are, you know, we are ourselves. What we're, what we're putting out there is, is us. So when people feel like, you know, Hey, you're just a commodity and, and I can, I can talk smack about you. I can talk trash about you. I can troll you on the internet. Um, if I see you in a store, I can tell you that I think you're an asshole. Um, you know, people feel very comfortable taking pot shots at people who are on TV. But the thing is, they're taking pot shots at us, like not our characters. Um, that's us, right? Yeah. You know? Yeah. And I've always so anyway, seen yeah, it that that's way. Just my, that's my long winded way of just saying thanks for, <laughs> you know, thanks for doing this because I think, I think people, it's, it's, it's good for people to know that when we go out there and play that game, that, um, you know, there, there is, there is a, a certain cost that comes with it, you know, for yeah, us. Yeah, 100%. And you're you're very welcome. I'm really just excited that I get to share this content and now I can share it with more people. So that's even exciting. So yes, and it's for people like you that are willing to do this that makes it possible. So I think there's some mutual thanks there. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so let's get right into it. So I like to kind of start with kind of the mentality before the game. So you get this call, you're going on Survivor, you get brought to LA, what is that like? What is that, you know, it almost probably I can imagine feels like, am I living a dream right now? It's, um, I mean, it was definitely a trip. And, uh, you know, back then when, you know, and I, I originally applied for season two Australia, 
Um, and I got, I, I got as far as the semifinals for that in casting, um, but didn't get cast. But back then, you know, it's, there are two, two sides of the coin there. So back then it, it was literally the number one television show in the world. And it was broadcast on every continent except for Antarctica. I mean, it was like, it was that big a wow. deal. And it was, the, it was the number one most viewed show in the world. It, it, tens of millions of people would watch each episode. Whereas I think now it's maybe like seven or 8 million, maybe six or 7 million. I don't, I'm not sure, but, but back then it was a huge, huge deal. So yeah, it was, you know, it, it was more than you can, you know, when, when you realize, yeah, I'm being cast and I'm being flown down to LA and I'm going to spend a couple of weeks in a hotel being interviewed by Probst and Burnett and Lynn Spillman and whatnot. I mean, it was, I, I couldn't even really wrap my head around it. And that's yeah. the other thing is, um, you know, back in the old school days, we, you know, we did not, it was still so new and, and the whole, like, I don't even know if it was called reality TV back then. It was just, you know, it, there wasn't a lot of reality TV. There was Survivor. Yeah. There was like, there was real world. Um, and that's just about it. Maybe Amazing Race came after. Maybe maybe it was, it started right around the time that Africa, but anyway, there wasn't a lot of it. And so we didn't really, you know, we didn't know what to expect. And, um, and I don't think, you know, nowadays people really, I mean, it's been, God, it's been around for over 20 years and there's over 40 seasons of Survivor. Yeah. You know, people that are people that are cast for the show now, I think, you know, and they've had because of social media, they've had a chance to, you know, converse with, you know, alumni, people that have played mm -hmm. before. You know, back when we did it, there was no social media either. Um, True. It didn't exist. There was no Facebook. There was there wasn't even MySpace. I mean, there was there was no social media. So oh. um, we were really we went into the whole thing really kind of um, oblivious of of how much it was going to change our lives. Um, so I, I feel like, you know, if you interview people for this, for this podcast that have played maybe in the last, I don't know, 10, 12, 15 years, their whole experience and, and how it kind of affected their psych, psyche and psychology is probably going to be different than those of us that did it in the really super early days, because Makes we didn't sense. know, we just didn't know there were, you know, before I played uh, Survivor Africa, there had only been 32 survivors, you know, so, yeah, and, and, wow. there was, there, and there was no way to talk to those people or, or connect with them. So, yeah, it's, um, so it's, it's, yeah, it's, it's, it's a trip. And, but, but I mean, I, I can, you know, I can remember those, those early days. I can remember them like they're yesterday in terms, because it, it, it was a, you know, it was a huge experience, a life-changing experience for me. My life was never the same after I played survivor. So I can remember, you know, getting the call, um, I can remember going to LA and being in that, you know, sequestered and locked up in that, in that hotel and being interviewed at all hours. And then, and I can remember, you know, I, I can vividly remember um, the flight that we all took, you know, to go to Kenya, you know, and yeah. how long it took and the fact that we couldn't talk to each other and what it, you know, what I felt in my, you know, in just in my, in my belly, that just that, that kind of, you know, just like electric, just excitement and, and that, and that really, really um, clear uh, realization that my life was about to change forever. And there was, you know, there was no, there was no turning back. It was like, I was never going to be the same again. And that was, you know, and that's exactly what happened. Yeah, which is really interesting. And I feel like anybody I have talked to has said something similar where it does, it changes your life, whether it's good, bad. However, some people say, you know, it doesn't change their life too much. And I think you're right. I have heard that about maybe newer school players don't have that as much because back then it was like you were a true celebrity whereas now it's kind of like okay you played survivor and then you go back to your life um yeah i mean and and, and it, you know it's it's there's it's impossible to kind of overstate what a mind bender that is because you know we people that are like you know back then you could say that those of us who are on survivor we had we were as recognizable and as well known as people like George Clooney and Brad Pitt and Madonna, you know, all of these like kind of A-list, you, you could literally not go anywhere in any part of the world. And I, I traveled a lot after, after Survivor and, you know, I cool. spent time in South America, in Europe, in Australia, in, you know, the South Pacific and everywhere I went, people knew me. I mean, I, I remember vividly going to Ecuador and people were literally 
you know, just like storing me in the airport and yelling my name. They didn't speak English, but they knew oh, wow. who I was. And that's like such a mind, such a mind bender. But when you think about it, you know, people like these A-list celebrities, now I don't think we're really celebrities. We're, we're kind of like, we're faux celebrities, we're sort of fake celebrities, but these real celebrities, they have, they have the benefit of, they go from total, you know, their, you know, obscurity and anonymity and, and it's just this gradual uh, journey where they, you know, maybe as a, as a kid, they do a commercial and then they might, you know, they don't go there. It's for us, it's like a light switch gets flipped. We go from totally anonymous, totally obscure to world famous overnight. Whereas wow. ordinary celebrities, it takes, they have time to kind of get used to mm. the whole thing, right? It's like, it's like going from, you know, hot water down to tepid water to cold water but they they have the op the opportunity to just kind yeah. of get used to it whereas for us it's like it is literally overnight you go from being somebody that no one has ever heard of or would know and then all of a sudden the next day your face is on you know people magazine at at every supermarket and you're on you're on tv and like you know a hundred million people are watching you and they know your name and they know who you are and and that's it's 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 a mind bender. I mean, it's it, it is really something that um, nothing can prepare you for that. And and it's equal parts um, super fun and exhilarating, but also kind of terrifying, and and kind Imagine. of um, really uh, it's it, it you know it's it's like I said, it's just a mind fuck. <laughs> and, <laughs> and and I you know and it just you, you don't get. You, you don't really get used to that. And, and, and yeah. again, none of us, I think we all knew, yeah, this is a big TV show and stuff, but I don't think any of us really kind of knew what it was going to be when we got home. And then, mm -hmm. and then this announcement was going to be made and we were, and then the show was going to air. I don't think any of us were prepared. Like, I mean, I, I, I remember there were situations like, you know, I'm having dinner with my wife and my two, you know, really young sons. They were, I think, maybe like seven and eight years old and we're having dinner and there's a news van parked outside of our house and they're filming through the window what? at us eating dinner. That's like so weird. Like how, wow. you know, what, what prepares you for that kind of situation? It's like, there's, you know, nothing does. And I, I never imagined in a million years that it was going to be like that. And um, it's just a trip. And then, you know, what prepares you for having, like stalkers, you know, I've had, I've had stalkers that threat, threatened to kill me and threatened to kill my kids. And, oh and they God. had, they found out what my home phone number was and they found out what my address was. And, you know, what prepares you for that? It's just, it's a trip, you know, but all that said, it's also, like I said, incredibly exhilarating and really super fun. Um, yeah. there's, no, no, there's no denying that. Oh, I can only imagine. I mean, it's it really is the experience of a lifetime. They don't lie about that. But so when you were in Africa, so we'll we'll kind of touch on both seasons. Um, but in Africa, it's known as the season where you get nothing. You didn't have anything. You're right. in the middle of a savanna. I've mm -hmm. been to Kenya. I know I know what that place is like, and just who I can't imagine camping out on just the savanna without anything. And with surrounded by just about as many things, everything out there can either hurt you or kill you, you know, mm -hmm. whether it's the wildlife, because, you know, every day we'd see, you know, hyena going by um, our camp and there were elephants and water buffalo wow. at night. We'd get the, the lions would, would visit at night. Um, and then, you know, virtually every single plant out there, including grass has thorns on it. I don't know if people realize that, but it's, it's like, it's, mm -hmm. it's like, it is the harshest environment. It's like, it's not fit for for humans. It's like everything out there, like I said, everything can hurt you or kill you, um, wow. you know? So, but but I, you know, if, if I was given a choice to go back in time and pick any season or any location, I would never, I, I would, I couldn't imagine picking anything other than Africa. It would still be my first choice. Um, I love the fact that, you know, most uh, most survivor alumni would would agree that it was, the hardest and harshest location there's you know there there are mm -hmm. not that many that would that would really try to kind of make the cre a credible argument that that their season was harder it was just it was the hardest and i kind of i kind of love the fact that we you know the 16 of us have bragging rights for having been <laughs> in you know in the gnarliest just you know harshest hardest environment i you know plus africa is just there's 
there's a power and an energy and a beauty of that, you know, mm-hmm. in that place that that is unparalleled anywhere else in the world. You know, I've seen a lot of places, but um, I've never been anywhere that affected me so kind of profoundly than Africa. You know, I can I can totally relate to that. It's one of the places that I tell my husband I want to go back to so bad. There's there is there's something really special about Africa, um, and especially yeah. I mean I went to Kenya, so just that area. Oh, just. It's amazing. It's incredible. Yeah. Yeah. So, so then you go and you probably, you know, go to all, all stars and you're like, all right, this is nothing. <laughs> you know, you have well, nothing and now you have some things. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. And no. I mean, you know, it, there, there were definitely, we had our share of kind of, you know, challenges and misery in all stars as well mm-hmm. in terms of like um, food. Yeah. I mean, there, there was food, there was food to be had. It was, you know, it was all around you whether it was coconuts or, you know, more importantly, you know, if you could, if you could fish and, you know, and I, I made a point before I went to all stars, um, I taught myself how to use a Hawaiian sling so that when I got out there, I could, I could actually, um, I could actually fish. And so, yeah, the food, food was not really a problem. Although, I mean, we were, we were hungry for sure, because, you know, you're probably still only eating about 10% of what you might eat when you're back home. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, the, the, the food madness is definitely still a part of it. Um, but in Africa it was, you know, I lost, I think almost 40 pounds I wow. think when I, when I left, you know, and I'm like, I'm six foot one. And when I left, I think I was 120 pounds, Holy um, wow. which, you know, I, it was, it was super, super gnarly, but, but the thing, you know, the, the, and, and, you know, the beauty of, of being on all stars is also that it was, you know, we were on an Island. Um, there was this you know, beautiful, warm water. Whereas in Africa, we had no water to swim and no way to, you know, wash ourselves. I know that I've heard from among the crew people, they've said that, um, that even to this day, there's never been a smellier cast than the Africa (laughs) cast because we had no way really to properly wash ourselves. So it was pretty gross. But the thing, the thing about, um, for me, the, the hardest thing about all stars, well, it was two things. From a physical standpoint, um, it rained. Yeah. I mean, nearly every day, and and we're talking about a rain that makes it's 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 you're in the tropics, but it's freezing when you when you're there and it's the middle of the night, and you've got rain hitting you. Um, it would get so cold that sometimes I would just go into the water in the middle of the night. I'd go into the ocean because it was warmer in the ocean. I would just wow. sit in the water because I couldn't just couldn't stand, you know, that constant dripping soaking wet freezing cold with the wind you know there were times where the the rain it was so stormy that the the rain was literally going sideways while there was lightning it was it was gnarly so that from a physical standpoint the rain was just super demoralizing and difficult but um the thing that was probably hardest about all stars is um it was the first time they ever had returning players yeah and um and, you know, most of us, because there were only, you know, I don't even know if, well, that would have been, what, seven seasons. There were about 100, maybe 100 survivors in total, yeah. you know, it, that had ever played the game. And at that time, because it was before social media, um, we all did a ton of charity events. Charities, nonprofits, they knew that the world, this is the most popular TV show in the world, what's the easiest way to to make, you know, to, to raise money for your charity mm-hmm. would be to have an event where these people are live and you can meet them because mm-hmm. at that time, that was the only way other than writing a physical letter and mailing it to a survivor that actually has their address mm-hmm. or their PO box published. There was no way to, um, to interface with, with these, you know, these celebrities that, um, that people were huge fans of. So, you know, we all did, I think at one point I was probably doing at least 20 plus charity events a year, which had me, and and I was flying everywhere, all over the U S and Canada, um, some stuff abroad, but mostly, you know, all kind Mm -hmm. of national. And, and so we, we all got to know each other really well because we all had this thing in common, um, having played survivor, this thing that not even our spouses could understand really what we went through and what we did. There's no way. I mean, you can t- tell somebody about it, but if they weren't out there, um, they don't understand. Yeah, of course. And so we craved, we all craved having 
time with each other because mm -hmm. those are like our, they became uh, other survivors, whether they were on your season or not, became like your family. They were the only people that understood what a mind fuck you'd been through and how, you know, and understand and, and had, mm -hmm. you could converse and talk about stuff and, and relate to each other. And, and, you know, the, the shrink that they, you know, they, they assign a shrink to all of us mm -hmm. when, when we play survivor and, and that shrink is at your disposal. They say for the rest of your life, you can call that shrink forever. Awesome. You will always have somebody to call if we want to. I've never personally reached out to my, to my head shrinker because I just never felt the need. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, there's, there's a reason they do that because it is, and that, and I remember our, our shrink, you know, the, the psychologist on the show told us, look, this is going to be, when you get home, um, you are going to crave connection with other people that played the game because, um, and you will have a form of PTSD. This is the closest thing, the closest thing to the experience that y'all will have had would be to be a be in the military and go and, mm -hmm. and, and fight. And, mm -hmm. and the feelings that you're going to have when you come home in terms of um, wishing that you were back in the game or uh, wishing you were back where you were or having issues with sleeping indoors, which was a big problem for me after sleeping in the dirt and under the stars for 30, 38 days. I was so claustrophobic. I did not want to, I'd wake up and like with night sweats wow. for two or three weeks because I'd, I'd wake up and I was, and I saw a ceiling and I saw walls and I didn't know where I was. Wow. And I, there were times in the very beginning when I got home that I just went outside and I slept in my yard. I just, my wife would wake up and I wasn't in bed and, and she'd say, where were you? I said, I was just out on the grass. I was just sleeping outside. Cause I didn't want, I was scared. I was, you know, I just didn't feel yeah. comfortable in, in the house. Um, but yeah, the, the, the psychologist said, you know, you are going to, it's going to be like you went to war and, and the people that you played the game with and other people that have played the game will be, you know, you'll feel a connection to them the way soldiers feel to each other. Mm -hmm. um, because, you know, you, if you go out, you know, I've, I've known people that have, that have gone out and they've, and they fought, you know, in the military, when they come home, you, you could listen, but the only people they really want to talk to and listen and have listened to them are people that understand. And that means 100%. by definition, it has to be other soldiers. And it's the same thing, same thing for us. So, you know, what I was getting to originally when I went down this, this whole rabbit hole was the hardest thing about Survivor All-Stars was that we all knew each other and we were all close. We were friends. Yeah. A lot of us were very close friends and none of us were prepared because there had never been an alumni season of return players. None of us really had any way to prepare our minds for what it would be like to play the most ruthless, hideous game against people that we knew and loved. And, you know, it's, it, you know, when you, when you meet people, when they're all strangers and you go play the game, like at in Africa, yeah, you get very close to those people, but they were strangers when you started. Yeah. And so there's, you don't think twice about taking them out, stabbing them in the face, stabbing them in the back, whatever, you know, it's, it's what you do. But when all of a sudden you've got, you're playing a game with people that you've known now for years, people that know your deepest secrets and, you know, bear in mind back when we played Africa, we had no idea they would ever do a return player season. True. True. We didn't even we think about no that. Idea. Nowadays, ever since all-stars, every single survivor that's played is always thinking when they're around other survivors, they're always mm -hmm. thinking about what if I get asked back and they're all, all of them are always like, I'm going to get, I want to get close to everybody. I, you know, how can I exploit this situation in the event that I might get called back and this person might be in the game with me. People are making alliances when they're not even, they haven't even been cast, but, but back wow. then we didn't think about that because none of us really thought about the fact that there was going to be a return season. And mm. at that time Probst was publicly saying, yeah, we're not, we don't, we're not going to do it. I don't believe in doing a return season. I don't like the idea of it. He hated yeah. the idea of it. Oh. So, so when we'd get together at these charity events, it's like, you know, you took, you shared everything. You told all, you know, all your, you know, these people were your, were your best friends. 
and you shared your secrets. Whereas nowadays, I think survivors are much more guarded because anything that will show weakness, if they happen to get cast in the future, they don't want people, there's things they don't want these other people knowing because that they, mm -hmm. those people could use it against them. Um, but back then, so all of a sudden we're in this game and we're like, shit. Um, shit just got really real. And it was, it was emotionally, it was torture sometimes. Um, you know, when you realize that you had, it's the game of survivor. There's only one winner. Yeah. There's, there, you know, you don't get to share. You don't, you, you need, <sighs> no. you need other people and you team up and you partner with other people, um, to the death. But the death means at some point, either you or that person that you aligned yourself with, one of you is going to have to go before the other. And only one person can win. And, and so all of a sudden we found ourselves on all stars, like, Oh shit, we, I've, I've got to get rid of all these, every one of them. I have to slay every single one of them if I want to win. And the only reason you have no business going out and playing that game, if you don't plan on winning. Mm -hmm. um, I agree. And so that was, that was, it was rough. That was, um, that was by far the hardest thing for me. Um, it caught me completely flat footed. I hadn't, I had no clue it was going to be that hard to the point where even I remember vividly uh, in the two or three days before we played the game, we were all already on the Pearl Islands mm -hmm. and they had us, they had us kind of sequestered by what our tribes were going to be. And we mm -hmm. were in these little, we were in these kind of, it was like a, like a little resort, you know, with huts on, you know, on these little islands. And, and in the days leading up, they had actually flown out because All Stars was a huge deal at the time because you know again mm -hmm. number oh, one yeah. show in the <laughs> number one show in the world first time they're bringing people back the players that they bring back are at this point globally recognized celebrities of course the press is slobbering to get you know to to get coverage to do coverage because you know you know what sells a lot of magazines is covering Survivor <laughs> yeah so Survivor the the Survivor PR machine realized. God, you know what we what we ought to do. In the past, we've always we've always been so secretive about who the cast is. Like to the point where when we went to when we went to Africa and we were flying, I remember going in the airport in Amsterdam. There was the, somehow the press realized that the cast of Survivor, the next season Survivor, was going to be in the airport, oh. and there were there were like press photographers and paparazzi. And they were bringing us onto the plane behind sheets, like they were holding sheets. Oh, wow. so, that these, so that these photographers couldn't take pictures, look up who we were, and then leak the cast before the season, right? But That's with All Stars, wild. we were all everyone knew who we were, and so Survivor thought, you know what, we're gonna we're gonna fly out a whole bunch of press people to Panama to the Pearl Islands, and so for two or three days before. Um, the game started, we were doing interviews with everybody, with, you know, CBS, but with People Magazine, with Us Magazine, with, you, know, you name it, TV Guide Magazine, um, you know, Entertainment Tonight, they were all there, and, and they, and the question they always, the, the, the first question out of their mouth was always, so how are you going to win this time? What, how's your game going to be different, or is it going to be the same? And, and I answered, I mean, I was convinced that I would be able to pull it off, but I told everybody the same thing. I said, you know what? I have this reputation. Everyone here who's playing the game with me knows that I'm like a super straight shooter. I'm really mm -hmm. honest. My word is my bond. I'm loyal. I don't stab people in the back. I stab them in the face. Um, mm -hmm. And I said, none of them are going to see me coming because I'm going to totally flip the script on myself. And I'm going to come into this game and I'm going to lie and I'm going to cheat. And I'm going to backstab and I'm going to mm -hmm. betray people and they're never going to see me coming. That's my secret weapon this time is what I told everybody. And they yeah. thought, God, that's great. That's awesome. I can't wait to watch it. Mm -hmm. And as soon as I hit that beach and we started playing, I just realized that I would, I could never pull that off. It was so not who I mm -hmm. am that um, I realized, man, I just, I shit the bed. I just told all these people, all these press people, <laughs> yep. They're going to put it in their magazines and on their TV. Everyone is going to say, oh, my God, Lex is going to do this. And then I'm going to I'm going to choke. <laughs> you know, they're going to watch the season and realize that everything that Lex promised he would do, he didn't do one of them. And that's exactly what happened. And as oh. you know, anyone who watched All Stars knows that 
um, my undoing and my death in the game was because I, I had, I could not be anything but loyal. It, you know, mm -hmm. I was loyal to such a fault that I became, you know, I have a reputation to this day of having been ha having pulled one of the stupidest moves in the history of the game. People, people still troll troll me about really? it. Twenty, you know. 17 years later they still troll me about it on you know on social media um it, people have not let it go um but that's that's just like a, a a window into you know why that game for some of us was so difficult now you could probably ask boston rob the same question and he would say mm -hmm. i had no problem playing against friends clearly and and i had no problem you know stabbing them in the back or in the face, you know, or talking yeah. smack about them, you know, he, but you know, that's, that's how he is. Um, mm -hmm. And, and it makes him a, by definition, a better survivor player than me um, because he is able to uh, really suspend everything. And, and he, he's willing to use every weapon and every tool in his arsenal. Whereas there are a lot of lines that I won't cross. Um, but, you know, that's what made all Star so hard is that, um, it was emotionally just, uh, it, it was it was torture sometimes. Wow, and that's actually one thing I've always thought about with the All Star season and kind of like that more mental side that I told you I kind of looked through that lens is how did that whole situation with Boston Rob affect your trust with people outside the game after in your real life? <clears throat> yeah, I mean, you no, know, I'd say that you know that that particular situation was really. It didn't. It didn't really impact or affect my trust in people in general. It, that that just hurt. That hurt me because it was, you know, I had a. I had before All Stars. I had a really deep friendship with with Rob. Um, mm -hmm. You know, we did a lot of stuff together. We talked on the phone constantly. Um, but, you know, to say that I that the experience of playing Survivor has not. I'd be lying if I said that it has not affected my ability to trust people but that happened back in africa so you know i was talking I was, I was talking to my wife yesterday about doing this podcast and yeah and she, and she said she says you know don't forget that um you know she says because i was i i had a view of you from the outside i you know i you know what what your mind is like but i know what i saw and yes. she says don't don't forget the fact that you were way 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 more psychologically fucked up after africa than you were after all stars and and a lot of that is probably because um you know that first experience like i said nothing can prepare you for the experience of playing this ruthless game no. in in the harshest conditions where you do kind of play with life and death and then coming home and being this huge celebrity and having the whole world have a view into your private life the second time you do that you've had a chance to you've already been prepared for the experience because you've done it once. Right. So it's, yeah. Is it, is it, is it, is it a cakewalk the second time? Absolutely not. But the first time definitely um, jarred me psychologically and, and, and had much more of an impact. You know, when I came home, I was, my wife said she didn't know who I was and this, you know, wow. I'd been married. I had been married to her at that point. I don't know. I mean, we've been together now for 33 years. So back then we'd been together for about 13 years and, you know, nobody knew me like she did, but she says, when I came home, um, aside from the fact that I looked like I'd been in a concentration camp because I was so skinny, but she said, your eyes look dark and they look empty. And she said that, you know, she didn't know me. Um, she, she said, you know, who is this guy? Who's I was, I was chronically paranoid. Um, which is not my nature at all, but I was paranoid about everything. I had, like I said, I, you know, earlier I was, I had extreme claustrophobia if I was indoors. I just only wanted to be outside. I had um, the world here, you know, when you live like with people, it's an, it's so noisy. Like when I got home, I was like, my God, this, it, there's so much noise. Like, traffic you know cars and yeah. everything is loud televisions and you go into a store and the colors are all loud and the lights are loud and the sound is loud um and i also you know i was i came home and i i was i was really i'm a guy that's always been super super social i have yeah. i've always had tons of friends i love people 
I get along with everybody. Um, but when I came home from Africa, I was totally antisocial. I didn't feel comfortable around my own friends. I didn't want to be in groups. I just, it, my wife and my two kids were like about as much as I could handle for a while. And, and I remember just being, you know, having trust issues with everybody. I, I, I didn't sh share of myself. I was guarded. My, my wife said, she said, my God, you were just, you were just a completely different person. And, and it's funny because, you know, the, the two people that whose opinion I trust the most and the only people that could probably say this to me that, 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 you know, they could get away with it, that I'd have to listen to would be my wife and my mom. And they both told, they both told me, and they've told me even recently that, um, doing survivor as wonderful as an experience as it was, they said, you know, it, it exacted a price that you, you left a piece of your soul when you played that game, it, there's a piece of your soul that was cut out of you that you'll never get back. Cause both my mom and my wife told me, and they've told me recently that it changed me and it changed me forever and not necessarily for the best, not necessarily for the better. Mm -hmm. um, you know, my mom described me as, you know, she says, you know, you, you were such kind of a bright light before you played survivor. And now there's always a bit of a, darkness there's you know you something about that experience jaded you in a way mm -hmm. that you've never recovered from and and you know and it was hard to hear that from both my wife and my mom when they said but, you know they, they said you're still you know what makes you you is still it's still all there but there are a few things that have changed enough that you know maybe other people don't recognize it but i do mm -hmm. And, and they, you know, they both said that's that change in your personality and that, you know, that change in your ability to trust people, um, that change in your, in, in my, in the way I view the world, I view the world now with a lot of kind of, I'm a much more dubious and skeptical person. I'm yeah. always looking for, you know, what, what's, what's the angle, you know, I, I used to be so much more kind of just. I was a terminal optimist about everything. I still yeah. am, but, um, but, but I, I definitely, I don't trust the system. I don't trust people. I don't trust organizations. I don't trust, you know, Hollywood. Um, I definitely, I have a much kind of darker view of kind of everything. And that's that, that, that part of me was kind of permanently broken when I played survivor Africa. And that's, you know, but that's, you know, I, I also, I'm, I'm a big boy and I understand that, you know, everything comes at a price. Mm -hmm. You don't get nothing. You never get to ride for free. That's 100%. how life is. And, and if, you know, if you have an experience in life that is, you know, you do something that is like, you know, moderately awesome, there's probably at some point, there's going to be some, the scales, there's going to be something moderately shitty that's, that's going to balance out that moderately awesome. If you do something <laughs> incredibly awesome or just like, extreme and it's it comes with extreme you know positivity like being you know famous the world over and having this incredible adventure you know at some point you got to pay the piper there's going to be an incredibly high price to pay for this incredibly great ride that you were on and i understand that and i and i totally accept it it was my choice i'm the one that signed on the dotted line i have yeah. absolutely zero regrets about any of it um, I would do it again a hundred times, you know, if, if I had to go back and, and I, I was faced with the decision when the casting person said, Hey, you've been cast. Are you in? Mm -hmm. um, I, knowing what I know now, I'd still say yes, a hundred times. And I think that's um, one of the most in incredible pieces is some of these moments can really just, it can, it hurts. And it's, it's like that with trauma in general. Like I see people all the time going through trauma and how that affects them. And a lot of times I heard this beautiful thing from a person once who had a terrible childhood and, they were able to come out and be like, you know what? Um, I wouldn't take it back for anything. Yeah, it wasn't my fault, nothing, but it made me the person I am today. And I wouldn't take it right. back for anything. That's right. I mean, you know, we're, we're all the, you know, all of us are always changing and growing as, you know, we live our lives. And all of these experiences, you know, make us who we are. And, um, and so, yeah, I, I don't, I wouldn't, I wouldn't want to change it either. Now that said, there are, you know, if you had like a spectrum of, 
people that have played survivor and the spectrum mm -hmm. was you know from the lowest amount of psychological trauma or um, yeah. uh you know the, the people that have released affected by it all the way the spectrum goes to the people that were like absolute casualties of the experience you know i'm probably down at the very very you know i've had i, I think i've put myself at the least just about the least amount as much as i've wow. been talking here because this is your podcast we talk about how we were affected i think i'm probably one of the ones that um because i had you know i went into the game my life was already set i was you know mm -hmm. i was a happy fulfilled person i had my wife you know my wife and i've been together like i said for 33 years um i've got you know beautiful kids that are now men um wow. but my life was all set i wasn't i wasn't playing survivor to try to find myself um mm -hmm. i was a 38 year old dude who um if i won or if i lost the game it wouldn't really make any difference in my life because mm -hmm. i wanted to win because i wanted i wanted the title I wanted to win mm -hmm. the money. The money would have been nice, but the money was probably the last reason that I was out there. You know, if I was to, you know, rate what's, you know, the number one reason I went was for the adventure. The number two reason, my number two goal was to win so that I could just say that I won. Yeah. You know, and then the number three reason would be, well, a million dollars. But, mm -hmm. um, but the thing is, you know, the, the point I'm trying to make is um, I was already a very, um, very comfortable in my own skin before I played Survivor, mm -hmm. and um, and I was happy and I had no issues at all. Um, so when I came out of it, I was pretty much other than just you know some of the PTSD that comes from playing the game and then yes. having to deal with this like instant like celebrity. That stuff was like I said, it was a mind bender. But still, um, I was still a happy person, and and I like I said, I never needed to call that psychologist that we've that we were assigned with because I just never needed to. I never felt like yeah. I had. I needed any help, um, but I know a lot of people and I'm close to a lot of people who were just absolutely fucked up and twisted wow. by the experience. And most of those people were the ones that were young. They were, they were too young to play the game. They, um, they, you know, it's like, it takes a while and, you know, before you are, before the cement kind of sets and you feel like, like you're done growing yes. or at least growing enough to where you're you've got a, a, a confident adult mind that is not riddled by anxiety or mm -hmm. doubt and young people i mean i was you know i was once in my early 20s if i had played survivor back then i would have been a complete basket case afterwards i it just i i think it's it's an infinitely harder game to play in terms of the after effects psychologically it's so much harder for young people. Mm -hmm. um, it's harder for, you know, for people like that. You know, I like for me, for example, I didn't care if someone said that dude is ugly or what, you know, yeah. that all of that, who cares? I'm, I never need to date again. I don't care. Yeah, what right. people, I've got a wife. <laughs> My life is all set. Right. Yeah. But, um, but for a young person who's, you know, might be single or whatever, it's just, there are so many more layers of issues to deal with um and and that's why a lot of those people they they were either broken for permanently or it took them years to get to a place where they weren't either depressed or miserable and there's also the you know the whole like the fame thing mm -hmm. some people for some people i still know some people that played the game almost 20 years ago and they are still trying to get used to the fact that they're never going to be famous. They so wanted, they got a taste. They got that taste of having people ask them for their autograph and having, you know, organizations fly them around the world and, you know, people loving them or just knowing who they were. And yeah. they just, it was like a drug. And, you know, it's like they've, they, they were turned into these fame junkies. It's like, it could be heroin or meth. Yeah, it's just, a, it's just a different form of, of a drug. And some of those people are still chronically miserable or depressed because they have never they've they they disappeared back into obscurity and they were never able to find their way back in that limelight. And for me, <laughs> quite the opposite, like after I'd been after it had been a year or two, 
I was like, God, please let, I want, I want off this ride. And, and I remember, yeah. I remember it was probably cause, cause I went and did it again for all stars. So I reset the clock and by the time I wasn't constantly getting stopped or recognized, even when I was driving from people driving by me in another car or wow. it took, it took probably, I think, cause I remember when it happened, when, when I, when I was able to go out in public and not constantly be you know every day every time be you know bombarded by people at, by strangers who knew who i was and that was probably after africa it was probably about seven years and and i and, and then i you know i i was asked to play survivor i've been asked three times since i did all stars and and i the first two times they asked me i said no because i was really I was really stoked to have my life back and to be reasonably anonymous. It felt really great. I didn't, I didn't want to the, the, the fame part of it to me was like, it was a necessary evil that came with that. Like if you want to play survivor, well, that's, you got to pay the toll and that toll is being famous for me. It wasn't a bonus. It was a, okay. it, it was a, it, it was a, uh, it was a, a negative consequence that I had to just put up with. So I was really happy when, when I wasn't famous anymore, but there are some people out there that um, they don't know how to be happy after, after they had that taste of that drug. Um, they don't know how to be happy without that anymore. And that's yeah. just, and that's sad. That's such a sad thing. It is so sad. And you, I mentioned, well, you mentioned that people have really been struggled from the game. And I know that I've definitely seen some interviews where people have almost, it, it felt like to me at least were almost, exploited because of that and it was it broke my heart um for one and it's it's terrible that sometimes tv does that to you or wants to use that against you with such a big experience i mean like you said i've heard some players they struggle with food after they're terrified that they're going to starve again so they just oh, yeah. eat well, everything and, and i was i was like that but after all stars i not so much for, i mean for africa yeah i was food obsessed but after all stars my wife said that i was i was like hoarding food i was hiding it Wow. I was hiding it in like weird cabinets and she would, she would open the cabinet. And she's like, what, what is this? What's this doing in this? In, in, why do you have food in your sock drawer? <laughs> like, I don't know. <laughs> I just, just so I have food, you know? Um, but it's, uh, yeah, it's, I mean, it's, it's, it's a trip. It really, it really is a trip. Yeah, and it's, it's sad because I, I feel like people, like you said at the very beginning, people don't understand that piece and they just think, oh, you just went on a show. And then some people are like, oh, it's all stage. It's not real. They shower, right. they get defeat. And, you know, it it's not. And you're out there yeah. with nothing and without that preparation. I know sometimes they give you like classes on different things that you need to yeah. learn to survive there. Um, but yeah, I know you mentioned about like the thorns on the ground and just having to worry about that. I mean, your shoes are probably falling apart. You're on these thorns. And I know the only time I've seen that on a show is naked and afraid and mm -hmm, seeing them mm -hmm. like walk through these thorns. And I actually was thinking while watching that, I'm like, I wonder if it was like that in Africa for the yeah. survivor players. And yeah, whew, and can't imagine. You know, when, when, when people, when people that are applying, you know, all of us that have played, we constantly, especially on social media. Now we constantly get hit up by people that say, what, what kind of advice can you give me? Mm -hmm. You know, if, if I want to be on survivor. And my first piece of advice before I even get into, you know, what to do on your tape or my first piece of advice is always be careful what you wish for, because it might come true. You know, just make sure, take, you know, take a look at yourself in the mirror and ask yourself, am I ready for everything that's going to come with this? Because it's not just a fairy tale that some of it is, but some of it is also a hot nightmare. And so just ask yourself, you know, do I really want this? You know, because you be, be careful what you wish for, because it might it might happen, um, you know, mm -hmm. so. Uh, yeah, the wild ride that has wild consequences. Mm hmm. Jeez. So I appreciate you so much coming on here. You've said some awesome things. I don't know if there was anything else that you feel like I've missed that you feel like we haven't talked about. I, I, I think we've I think we've covered most everything and hopefully this wasn't just you know because all of us had you know all of us that played survivor have had you know a similar experience so hopefully this just wasn't a repeat and a rehash of what all of your other guests have not at all have shared but 
I feel like I'm getting a, um, I've only interviewed three people and I feel like every single person, there's been a little, something a little bit different. So no, it's not the same story. And it's been great hearing all of these things that I, you know, you don't usually see online. And I think it's, you know, an important topic and I hope that it helps some people out. And I hope that viewers just enjoy the content in general. Yeah. And I, and I think, again, I think it's, it's really cool and it's important that you're doing this because, you know, as much as we get asked about our experience and we, we all do these podcasts or people, mm -hmm. you know, in the general public will ask you, you know, what it was like. I've noticed, you know, over the last 20 years, any time, and it just virtually almost everybody that you share something with, almost everybody has responded or made it kind of obvious in their response that when, when I share something that's, slightly negative about the experience, mm -hmm. they don't want to hear it. It's almost like, um, I don't know if it's because people don't want to know the harsh truths of mm -hmm. the game because um, maybe they'll feel guilty about, you know, loving being entertained by people that might have had some terrible experiences. I don't know if it's because, you know, they, they love, you know, it's like, no, you know, a lot of people don't want to see, you know, they, they love the idea of the Wizard of Oz being this huge, yes. they don't want to look behind the curtain because, oh, that just ruined everything. And, and, you know, and I know that when I've shared, there's some stuff that I just won't talk about anymore because I know that people, pe people are really disappointed when they hear about that. And, and you can see in their eyes. And then when you share something like this with them, you can see in their face that they didn't ever want to hear that. They didn't, they wish they'd not heard that and they didn't want to know that. Like stuff, you know, I've learned that one of the things I don't talk about is um, the experience of, of realizing and knowing that production is sometimes manipulating the game. Mm -hmm. That it isn't just 16 or 18 of us out there playing against each other. There are times like, you know, and this is again, it's one of the dirty secrets of Survivor. You know, if you think that it's just a coincidence that they started putting hidden immunity idols in the game. Um, that it's because that it is truly something that uh, an, an element of complete chance mm -hmm. and and that it's fair. It totally isn't. Like I, as soon as I saw the hidden immunity idols, knowing what I knew from the first two times I played, I realized I know what they're doing there. They there may be a time where they've got a player like a Russell Hance that they want. They don't mm -hmm. they don't want Russell out in one or two episodes. They want him to last the whole as long as possible before he gets voted out because. He's a delicious villain. He's good for their franchise. So a guy like him, well, hidden immunity idol. We know that Russell at this time of day, every every day goes and he gets water. Let's just pop a hidden immunity idol mm -hmm. right by where he's going to go. It's their way of being able to kind of subtly manipulate the game. These mm -hmm. That is one of the topics that I learned. I don't talk about that, about that with fans anymore because when they hear that this kind of sacred – game this show that they've been watching for 20 years when they find out that it isn't actually fair <laughs> and that it yeah. isn't and, and that it isn't just the players who determine their fate but also Probst and Burnett and the producers it is they I can see it in their face they hate hearing that and I understand yeah. that so that's why I don't talk about it like mm -hmm. I'm talking about it now I probably shouldn't have talked about it because <laughs> Anybody who watches is going to go, if they haven't heard that, they're going to be like, oh, man, why did you even have to talk about that? I didn't want to know that about Survivor. I would yeah. rather think that it's this pure, competitive, real game, like the Olympics or something. But, mm -hmm. I mean, let's, you know, let, let's be real with each other. Even, like, professional sports, there have been so oh, many, yeah. scan so many scandals oh, yeah. where they realize that, you know, like boxing is, is you know, prime example of – you know, boxers throwing a match and getting paid for it. That's just the reality of the real world. Um, mm -hmm. When, if you, you know, you got to ask yourself, is, is money being made? Is this a big business? Yes. The business of Survivor is squillions of dollars. Yeah. Squillions of dollars for CBS, for Burnett, for probes, for mm -hmm. the advertisers, the sponsors. It's big business. Anytime there's money in business, by definition, there's, it's going to be corrupt. There's going to be corruption in there. Yeah. Um, but people hate to hear that. So that's like one of the taboo topics I just don't cover, you know, 
Yeah, I've heard a lot more players open up about things like that uh, more recently on either TikTok, Instagram and other places. So I feel like it's a, something that's being more talked about. For me, I still yeah. look at that as it's still I get invested in the people and when I yeah. watch the show. So to me, it's it's part of it. We understand it. And I still try to just enjoy the ride as I can <laughs> right, with, the, right. with the game in general. But yeah, yeah. Um, but thank you so much, Lex. Like I said, I really appreciate it. And there's been people on people that are wanting to look at this content that really were hoping that you'd be on here. So I think they'll be really thrilled. So yeah, thank you. Well, so I, I much. appreciate it. Thank thank you so much for having me, Sarah, and and everyone out there um, who's been watching the show for years. Um, thank you for your support. Um, it you know it means the world to all of us. So thank you guys. All right, and thank you everybody. Lucy Nicotine is a company founded by Caltech scientists and former smokers looking for a better and cleaner nicotine alternative. Finally, tobacco alternatives that don't suck. Researched and developed for three years to be made for people, not patients. Lucy has created a nicotine gum with four milligrams of nicotine that comes in three flavors, wintergreen, cinnamon, and pomegranate. Lucy also has a lozenge with four milligrams of nicotine in cherry ice flavor each and every flavor actually tastes great and it's convenient and discreet products can be enjoyed anywhere on flights at work on the go or even in the gym i am so happy that lucy is sponsoring us ever since they came on board i have gotten no less than five of my friends transitioned over to lucy and put their cigarettes down they like the gum. I'm used to seeing the packages all around. This stuff is great, and it's really helping people make much healthier choices. So get on board and join the Lucy movement. Hey, it's 2021. Get rid of your cigarettes, unplug your vape, throw out your dip, and get some Lucy nicotine gum or lozenges. This is the real deal. A subscription to Lucy comes directly to your door each month. It's so simple that you don't even have to leave your house because Lucy has delivery down. Reality NSFW listeners, go to lucy.co and use promo code SURVIVOR to get 20% off all products, including gum or lozenges. That's lucy.co and use promo code SURVIVOR at checkout. Also, I have to give this disclaimer. Warning, this product contains nicotine derived from tobacco. Nicotine is an addictive chemical. That's lucy.co, and be sure to use that promo code SURVIVOR. This episode of Reality NSFW is sponsored by Blue Chew. Say it with us, Blue Chew. Blue Chew is making waves and bringing more confidence to the bedroom by offering chewable tablets that can help men get stronger and longer lasting erections. That's right, we're giving away super hard dicks. Blue Chew is a unique online service that delivers the same active ingredients as Viagra and Cialis, but in chewable form and at a fraction of the cost. Blue Chew's tablets help men achieve harder, stronger erections to combat all forms of ED. Blue Chew is an online prescription service, so no visits to the doctor offices, no awkward conversations, and no waiting in line at the pharmacy. And it ships right to your door in a discreet package. The process is simple. Sign up at bluechew.com, consult with one of their licensed medical providers, and once you're approved, you'll receive your prescription within days. And the best part, it's all done online. Blue Chew's licensed medical providers work with you to find the right ingredient and strength for your prescription. Don't like swallowing pills? No problem here. Blue Chew's Sildenafil and Tadalafil tablets are chewable. Blue Chew's tablets are made in the USA and they prepare and ship direct, so it's cheaper than a pharmacy. Hey, if you're looking to give that immunity idol to someone or you don't want to be voted out of a crater, don't worry, Blue Chew's got you covered. So if you could benefit from extra confidence when it's time to perform, visit bluechew.com for more details and important safety information. And we've got a special deal for our listeners. Try Blue Chew free when you use promo code SURVIVOR at checkout. Just pay $5 shipping. That's Blue Chew, B-L-U-E-C-H-E-W dot com, promo code SURVIVOR to receive your first month free. And we thank Blue Chew for sponsoring the podcast. We're all trying to eat better, but healthy breakfast doesn't have to be boring. Magic Spoon has the amazing flavors you love 
but without all the bad stuff. And it's amazing as a midnight snack right before bed. Zero grams of sugar, 13 to 14 grams of protein, and only four net grams of carbs in each serving. That's only 140 calories per serving. It's keto-friendly, gluten-free, grain-free, soy-free, and low-carb. And build your own box. Available flavors to build your very own custom bundle are cocoa, fruity, frosted, peanut butter, blueberry, cinnamon, cookies and cream, and my favorite, maple waffle. Now, Magic Spoon recently brought back their two super popular flavors, cookies and cream and maple waffle. Thank goodness. But they're back permanently. And when these flavors were first introduced for a limited time, they sold out extremely quickly. Now, I'm here to let you know you can get them again or try them for the first time. Why? Because they're delicious and indulgent. Johnny, Magic Spoon has so many great flavors that I really enjoy, and even my kids enjoy them. We have the cocoa, fruity frosted, peanut butter. All these are really great combinations. Um, they enjoy waking up in the morning and getting some Magic Spoon right off to start their day great before they head off to school. I think everybody listening should give Magic Spoon a try, or if you've tried them already, it's time to reorder. Let's get you some more Magic Spoon and uh, get your day started right. Hey, when I finish a podcast late at night, the first thing I'm thinking is not sleep. It's let me grab a delicious bowl of Magic Spoon before I go to bed. So go to magicspoon.com forward slash survivor to grab a custom bundle of cereal and try it today. And be sure to use our promo code survivor at checkout to save $5 off your order. And Magic Spoon is so confident in their product, it's backed with a 100% happiness guarantee. So if you don't like it for any reason, they'll refund your money, no questions asked. Remember to get your next delicious bowl of guilt-free cereal at magicspoon.com slash survivor and use the code SURVIVOR to save $5 off. Thank you, Magic Spoon, for sponsoring this podcast.